All right, let's get started. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> I gotta separate all of you here out front. <laughs> all right, guys. Okay, hello, hello. Last lecture before um, before the spring break. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, we're not gonna have a quiz today. Although, although I was hoping to have a quiz today, but I didn't get a chance to put it together uh, because of a tire situation in my car. So I was running a little late today. And um, yeah, so we're gonna try to finish up with regression today. I've already assigned a uh, assignment for you for due next Thursday, uh, not next Thursday, this Thursday after next Thursday. Sorry, I'm like, there's a song in my head that I, I've, I've been humming for like two months now, but like, it's, it's like, too, it's called it's the Wellerman song. Are you guys familiar with it? Have, has anyone heard it? Just Google it. It's gonna be stuck in your just kind of YouTube. Pick the Nathan Evans version. It's got like 94 million views. My my son is in love with it, and you know we have to listen to it every morning like 50 times in the car. And so you know I have I have no other space in my head but for that song. And one of your colleagues on Zoom uh, heard me hum it, and he was like, "Are you are you humming the Wellerman song?" So uh, it's a it's an old uh, I think uh, a Scottish. Uh, song about uh, yes um the it's a sea shanty yeah the wellermen the weller brothers they uh, were kind of they supported uh you know, whaling story about a whale uh, anyway fun song good to play on the guitar too uh, okay all right so uh, i want to do two three things today i want to go back to uh, where we where we left off last time on the notebook we really didn't get a chance to exercise the normal equations on something that's not a polynomial, right? So like cosine or logarithm, et cetera. Unfortunately, there's not much data on that out there. So we have to kind of fake that data. And I wanna show, so I'm gonna take this opportunity to show you how to create some data with noise, just random noise, okay? And then try to fit those data. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna take a model like A cosine, A sine X squared, uh, B log X, okay? Create data based on that model plus noise, and then, and then try to fit the noise using that model and see how it looks like. Okay, so give you a chance to also see how you can perturb or add some noise to some data. Okay, so go ahead and grab, um, grab your Jupyter notebooks from last time. And what we're gonna do here is, let me see, just find my way around. All right, okay. So suppose, okay. First, I wanna generate some data um, that looks like, okay, so suppose that you want to fit a linear regression model of the form. Again, equation and equation. And really, we can pick whatever, whatever you can. You, as we're doing this, create whatever function, whatever, whatever complex model you want. Okay. So let's say we want um, the model to be. Um, <coughs> y equal. Um, let's see, sine x squared. So sine squared x really. Let's just sign x squared, however you want to do it, um, plus um, log x. Okay, so suppose this is kind of the data is distributed this way. Okay, so now we don't have data like that really. Uh, you know, it was I tried to find existing data that looks like that. I, I couldn't find anything. So we're going to manufacture those data. The way you do this, so clearly if you go ahead and create a linear space, for x values, you know, mp.lint space, we're gonna go from, um, you know, something like one e to the minus three, because you have a log, all the way to, you know, um, let's say 20 with 100 points, and then you can create a um, some yi data, which is mp.sign x squared, okay, plus mp.log 
sorry, xi, xi. Okay. Then plt dot plot. This is what your data is going to look like. Okay. And let's see, marker size, marker size equal three. Okay. Looks like this. Kind of nice and well structured. But in practice, data is not going to be like this. So let's, let's fake that. Let's add some noise to it. Excuse me. The way you do this is use a random number generator. There's one that comes in built in with NumPy. Bless you. Um, mp.random. So that gives you access to the random li to the library in NumPy that generates random numbers. You can generate all sorts of random numbers, uniform distribution, normal distribution, etc. We're just going to do a uniform distribution. Uniform. And those data are going to be, so with the uniform distribution, you go from, you can go between 0 and 1. I'm going to go from minus 1 to 1. And um, of the size of the say, so I want to generate this many numbers. So how many, how many random numbers do you want to generate? Because xi is an array and yi is an array, but I want yi to be an array, I want generate, I want to generate one random number per value of yi. So I create n, n random numbers of length xi. And then when you do this, this is kind of what you get, OK? Now we can make it a little bit tighter by, by kind of scaling the random number, let's say you know, 0 0.5, so you get something like this. Now when you see this, <clears throat> like if I saw data like this, I could tell you that this is log and a sign or square root and a sign. Because if you look at the logarithm or the square root of x function, they both kind of look like this. And then add on top of it is a, an oscillation. So that is probably a summation between a log or a square root and a sign. Okay. So now suppose you're given those data, x, y, and y, i distributed like this. Okay. Now your objective is, okay, so now fit those data using a regression model of the form. Okay, so it's going to look the same, but we're going to have two parameters now. And really, the purpose of this is to show you how we use the normal equations with like some other functions than a polynomial. Last time we just used the polynomial. Okay, so y model is equal a sine x squared plus b um, times log of x. You don't need parentheses um, when you have just a single argument. So I'm going to do sine x squared like this. OK? So that's our model. Now we're going to use the normal equations like we did last time. OK? So if you, OK, I'm going to keep this for a moment here for you to kind of see what I'm, what I typeset. And Jake, so we're just creating manufactured data so we can fit in a non-polynomial. Last time we just did the polynomial, like one and X squared. Right now I want to fit like sine squared X and log, okay? So I manufactured some data, okay? Um, and you, you'll follow it on YouTube if you want. Okay. Yeah. So I'm recording this. Um, they're all you can follow. You'll be able to follow it on YouTube. Okay. So if you recall, we using the normal equations. Um, since I only have two parameters here, I'm just gonna grab um, this uh, this stuff over here. Okay. So I'm gonna grab this guy, this guy, this guy, all of those. Just up. Then allow me to copy them. Okay, let's just kind of type it, type it together. So first we get the length of the array. Well, we don't need the length of the array, right? Because now our basis functions are, what are the basis functions? Sine squared, x, and log x. Okay, so, so in my column stack or in the A matrix, that's what I need. Sine mp dot sine xi squared. Oops. 
and mp.log xi. So notice numpy log is the natural, natural logarithm, whereas log 10 is the log base 10, okay? So, so np.log is equivalent to the natural logarithm. All right, so that's my, my A matrix from the normal equations. And then ATA is A dot transpose at A and A and B, my right-hand side is equal to A transpose times Y. And my solution is MP dot Lin algebra. Did I import NumPy? Lin algebra dot solve. Okay, ATA B. So that gives me the coefficients A and B. We can print solve. You get one and zero point nine. Exactly right because. That's kind of what our data was like. Okay. So A is sol zero and B is sol one. So the first entry and the second entry. And now we can define, we need to, to see how good this fit is. We need to create a routine that can plot and evaluate this, this new model. Okay. Um, sine log model so X and I return. A times MP dot sine X squared plus B times MP dot log X. So that's my prediction, okay? And now we can plot everything. Give you a second. <laughs> Sounds like the front desk of an airline with the, you know, when they get on the keyboard, it's like. <laughs> All right, take a moment. Now we can plot these data. So I'm gonna plot the original data X, I, Y, I with a symbol O, marker size two, okay? And on top of that, I'm gonna plot the prediction, plt.plot um, X, I and, and my sine log model at X, I. And I'm gonna do this as a black dashed line, okay? And I'm gonna label this as input data. I'm gonna label this label equal least, least squares regression, okay? Then plt.legend to plot the legend, then plt.grid, ta-da! Yes, good, okay. Just to show you something with the normal equations that was not one and x squared and x cubed, okay? Just know the basis functions, first column, first basis function, second column, second basis function, and you're done. Okay. In practice, you'll hardly encounter crazy data like this. And sometimes it's really hard to guess what the model is. You gotta have tremendous experience with functions and modeling. Usually, however, in your field of expertise, you expect a few types of models. So with you know, reaction mechanisms, we expect exponential models. With bacterial uh, contamination and decontamination, you expect um, reciprocal models. You see this example in your homework assignment, okay? So, you know, then it becomes, you'll know what model you need to use to fit the data. COVID-19 data, ah, who the heck knows, right? So nobody knows. Maybe we need to look a little bit at a little bit longer time frame. okay? All right. So with this done, I would like to switch gears because I really want to finish up regression today, okay? Anyone needs my help? Okay, last call. Okay, great. Now we will switch back to regression and we are gonna finish off with nonlinear regression, okay? Like your name tags in front of you, 
Okay, so I can kind of start to remember you more and more. <laughs> So by now, you should have a pretty darn good idea whether your model is linear, right? Really, if you can pull out the coefficients, separate the coefficients from the basis functions, okay, like products, then you are you have a linear model. Everything else is going to be nonlinear, okay? So really, that's the answer, okay? But we still want to derive the equations for nonlinear regression. We're not going to be able to solve them in this chapter. You're going to have to wait a couple of chapters to learn how to solve nonlinear systems of equations. But at least, you know, I'll get to show you um, how to derive those. And you will be able to know how to derive the governing equations for nonlinear regression. And you should know how to do those, okay? All right. So what makes a regression model linear? Strictly, you know, we kind of know intuitively and by inspection, if the parameters in the regression model show up linearly, or if they can be separated from the basis functions, like product parameter times the basis function one, parameter times basis function two, then your regression, you know that that's going to result in a linear regression. Strictly speaking, and that's why I mentioned last time, I like to call to say, I like to separate the meaning of linear regression versus regression to a straight line. I like to use the word linear regression to strictly mean that your system of equations that governs the unknown parameters is a linear system of equations. In other words, the parameters that show up in your model show up linearly. Really, you're not fitting sine or cosine or log, you're fitting the coefficients so that their combination with sine and cosine kind of finds the best, the minimizes, puts the curve that minimizes the error. So I like to call linear regression when, it's, when your system of equations for the parameters is linear. So again, that's like the strict definition. Now we can do by inspection, but like I said, strictly, you know, the least squares equations can be written as system of linear equations in the unknown coefficients. Now, the first one, it's more of like intuition. You can say, yeah, I can separate the coefficients, et cetera. But the latter, if you want to use the latter to show that the system um, is linear, is you know, one of two things. You either derive, you either have to derive the least squares equations and show, look, look, they, they, are, they result in system of linear equations. Where well, we saw last time that that was annoying as heck, right? So we don't want to do that. But we learned the other version of using the um, normal equations, and which is a much easier way. So now we're going to use this technique and say, if you can write your A matrix, if you can separate the coefficients from the basis functions, essentially, then your regression model is linear. Okay. So here's this example. These are the two methods to show. So we know by inspection that this is linear because the A and B can be separated from the basis functions X and one. If you were to show that this is results in linear regression by using the least squares, that's the annoying path. However, using the normal equations, all you have to do is write, if you are able to write your matrix A, okay, and separate it from the coefficients. So that's essentially another way of saying, yeah, by inspection, we know how to do this by inspection, then you are good to go. Either one of those is, is okay. Eventually, you're just gonna look at a model and say, oh, this is linear, that's it. All right, so now I'm gonna present you with a bunch of models on this first um, column. And I want you to take a few minutes to tell me which model is linear and which model is nonlinear. Now, you, should, you are allowed to do whatever manipulation whatever mathematical operation you can, okay, to segregate terms, okay, separate them so that you expose the linearity in that model, okay? All right, go ahead. Work in groups, please. Be loud and let me hear you. <laughs>
Do you want to work? Do you want to work together? Yeah? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. You, yep, write down, write things down, write down, do math, okay? And separate coefficients from basis functions if you can. If you cannot separate, then your model is nonlinear. You're right, exactly. Sine of A is sine, is whatever, yeah, it doesn't matter. It's a constant, yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> you need to be able to back your answer with an explanation. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten groups. Okay. Hey, Luke, do you want to work with them or with Lucia and, and Rich, whichever? Yeah. So remember, you are allowed to use mathematical operations like you can take a log, you can take the inverse, whatever. Okay? Pardon me? You can, you can. Yes, sir, you can. Yep. Do whatever, whatever is in your power. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can manipulate, take a log, take the reciprocal. Pardon me? Well, e to the alpha times e to the x is equal e to the, it's not equal e to the alpha x, right? <laughs> yeah. It, should, it would be e to the alpha to the power x e to the alpha times e to the x e to the alpha plus x so right yeah product of the exponentials adds the exponents okay <laughs> you guys nailed it all okay this is cool, like, you know, writing on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, especially when you are able. I used to have one of those notebooks, like early on, Hewlett Packard. Came. The best thing about it was I could, I was able to write on it as if, you know, put my paw kind of this side of my hand down and just write as if I'm writing on a paper. But then, you know, I lost all of the notes and... <laughs> Okay. 
Yeah, you have to, right? Because you're applying log to the entire model, right? So A plus B is not going to separate. Log A plus B is not going to separate, yeah. And remember, you can rename, you can rename log Y to a new Y, right? Yeah. Okay. You're all set, okay. <laughs> all right. Few more, few more seconds. <laughs> Thirty seconds. Yes. And mm -hmm. you're allowed to do that, and you can rename things like log y. You could call it my y or whatever. Right? New variable. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not. I'm not at that slide yet. <laughs> Anna. Okay. <laughs> okay, so Han Hannah, you're right. So so you are allowed, okay, guys, you are allowed to do manipulation, but you're not allowed to take transformation like logarithm. But that's okay. But that's okay because that's what we're gonna discuss next. But the model as is, if you're not applying a transformation, thank you for putting that up. If you're not applying a transformation like log or taking the sign or something or the inverse or whatever, then you know just assess the model as is okay see but you're able you're welcome to separate like sign of a sum or sign of a product whatever you know you 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 are allowed to do that even actually the reciprocal okay so let's go ahead and um talk this through okay we have what nine models we got about nine groups okay we'll start this way and go around okay um jake and kimball first one Clearly, because the coefficients show up linearly. Okay, Hannah and all linear. Why? Uh huh. And one over x is a basis function in f itself, right? And you can call that my your new x, or you can keep it one over x. Yes, correct. So you heard that. So you got a x plus b times one over x. So your basis functions are x and one over x. Okay. Now, third one. All right, we'll start from the back. Rich and team. Sign A X plus B. Yeah, yeah, because sign A is just, you know, you call that a constant A or new A, capital A, right? So you get A X plus B. They do show up linearly. You can separate them from the basis functions, which are X and one. All right. Izzy and Izzy and team. Sorry, I couldn't see your name. Yeah. Nonlinear. Why? Uh huh. So sine ax. There's sine of a product. You know, you're not. Yeah, you can't separate that. If it were a sum, then there's a way to separate it. But sine ax, you can't separate that. So a is embedded. You know, within the sine and x. So. You can't separate that. That's a nonlinear model. Okay. All right. Um, Brooke, Nathan. Oops, I gave you the answer. <laughs> okay. What about this one? Brooke, Nathan, and Alex. Yeah. Okay. Why?
So this is a squared x squared plus b. A squared, so the basis functions are separated from the coefficients. Whether you call it a squared, a to the 15, doesn't matter, it's just a number, okay, over there. So you can separate the co coefficients, the parameters from the basis functions. All right, I don't know if you all work as one group, you're sep separate. Okay, so Ryan, um, you wanna take this one? It is nonlinear, right? Unless you do a transformation, Okay, we'll talk about that later. Okay, you can linearize it. Okay. All right, so Alicia, this one. That was not linear, correct. Okay, because there's no, way, there's no obvious way right here, okay, to separate this. Now, even if you take a log here or log there, it's still gonna be impossible to separate log of the sum summation. All right, so Nathan in the back and team, what about this one? Yeah, why? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's just a number, a coefficient, a parameter. That's your new parameter multiplying your basis functions x and x squared. The easiest way is just look at the basis functions, you know, x and x squared, see if they can multiply out the coefficients. Okay, Nile and Maxime, this one. We you cannot transform. If you transform, yes. Yes, thank you. So it is nonlinear because you cannot separate these coefficients from the basis functions, okay? Beta shows up kind of linearly, but alpha does not. Now, if you were to take the log, we will see this in a minute, then it becomes linear, okay? We can linearize, it. all right? And kind of that's, that's the answer. And I show you here um, kind of some details on kind of seeing that whether you can separate the basis functions from the coefficients. Really, that's kind of what you have to think uh, the way the way you think about it okay so this is the sine ax plus b Let's just call it ax plus b and so on whenever you can linearize a model do it it's cheaper it's easier okay but solving a linearized nonlinear model versus solving a nonlinear model you're not going to get the same answer interestingly okay all right so those are these guys over here are also all linear. So this one is linear, linear, nonlinear. Okay. All right. So now we're going to hit the nonlinear regression. So those models that are fully nonlinear. Okay. And we're going to see, okay, what do you do? You, you, you are bound to put a model that is nonlinear. So in the previous data we had, Suppose in the previous manufactured data, suppose I wanted to do sine AX plus, log, plus B log X. That makes the model nonlinear. And that's really rich because it allows us to capture frequency, okay? So if we were missing the frequency, so sine AX allows you to capture the frequency rather than just the standard frequency of sine x, right? So it allows you to, to capture the frequency of the data. And that's very important, but that's nonlinear, okay? So how do we go about and obtain the equations that govern nonlinear regression, okay? So we assume, again, that your model has n parameters, so a and b and c or a naught, a1, a2, same thing, um, mixed up with some functions. You no longer have kind of basis functions here. Well, you kind of do, but they're not separated from the coefficients. The coefficients are embedded with your basis functions. Okay, so you could say, I'm gonna use a sine model, but I'm gonna put sine omega x plus uh, beta, for example, you know, then your coefficients are embedded. You can separate your basis functions entirely. And here's like one example, cosine a naught x plus e to the minus a one x squared plus sine a two x squared. It's, very non, it's a very nonlinear model. Well, turns out that the methodology for regression has nothing to do with whether the model is linear or not. The idea of minimizing the square of the error, remember when we first started, had, we didn't say anything, that, anything about the model, whether it's linear or not. It's fi, right, f of xi. So in principle, you can take that methodology, you know, define that sum, of yi minus fi squared and put in whatever fi you want and see what you get, okay? So this methodology also applies for nonlinear models, except that fi now, the, co the parameters in fi are gonna show up nonlinearly, okay? So here, we're gonna do this for an example, with an example, because there's, it's not, 
you know, if you have to do it, you have to do it by hand for every problem you're dealing with. There's no way around this. There's no normal equations version for nonlinear regression. You got to do it the painful way. Okay. So to minimize S, you have to take its derivative with respect to all of the parameters, A and B and C or A naught, A1, A2, all of the parameters in your model. Okay. Um, let's take this model, for example, alpha E to the beta X. In this case, our parameters are alpha and beta. And our total summation for the error is yi minus fi squared, and fi is alpha e to the beta xi, okay? So now, all you have to do is take the derivatives with respect to alpha, the derivative of s with respect to alpha, and the derivative of s with respect to beta, and set those equal to zero. Now, if you had trouble doing derivatives last time, this is harder, because now you have these parameters embedded in these nonlinear functions. So your derivatives are going to be a little bit even harder. So you better work through your differentiation, OK? There are a couple of examples here, but there's no way to cover kind of all cases, right? But at least work those examples out and refresh your memory with differentiation. So with respect to alpha, okay, so remember the derivative of this quantity squared is equal to two times this quantity times the derivative of this quantity with respect to alpha. Okay, so in this case, the derivative of this quantity with respect to alpha is equal to the sum of this derivative with respect to alpha, which is zero. And for this guy, it's minus e to the beta xi. Okay, so you get minus e to the beta xi and you have the two, right? And you have this quantity. Same thing with respect to beta. You get two times this quantity times the derivative of this quantity with respect to beta. The derivative of this quantity with respect to beta is the sum of the derivatives of this with respect to beta and that with respect to beta. This one doesn't have beta, so the derivative is zero. But over here, derivative of minus alpha e to the beta xi, okay? So that's a product. So again, you have to take the sum. So d alpha by d beta plus d e to the beta xi by d beta. So d alpha by d beta is zero, but the other one you get alpha, you get, you're going to get alpha uh, xi, right? Because the derivative of e to the beta xi with respect to beta is xi e to the beta xi, right? And this is what you get. It's more annoying than what you did last time, but just kind of do it step by step, dissect it step by step. Remember what you're differentiating against. Everything else is constant, okay? All right, so we have two unknowns, alpha and beta, and we have two equations. So the system is closed and well posed, but those equations are nonlinear. You cannot write them in matrix form like we did all the time. And that's where we stop here. We don't know how to solve this yet. This is a system of nonlinear equations, okay? We will learn how to do this in a few weeks. But as far as regression is concerned, we stop here, but you, you should know how to get to those equations because it's a matter of applying the principle of regression to minimize the square of the total error, okay? And I have another example on the next slide, kind of for your benefit. So please work through those examples, write them down, try to differentiate them. You get in trouble, shoot me an email, you know, come to student hours, come to help sessions, talk, talk to me, okay? Talk to us. Again, you define this, the total error and then you differentiate with respect to A and B, you know, and you get, two equations with two unknowns, okay? All right. Now, so you're responsible to derive these equations. You don't know how to solve them, okay? I, I don't even remember. I need to kind of scratch my head a little bit too. Kind of <laughs> because, you know, nonlinear non solvers are 
kind of one of the hardest chapters that we're going to hit next. Okay. However, as you saw in that previous slide, in some cases where you have a nonlinear model, you can apply a transformation, like take the log or take the inverse, you know, one over that quantity, and you can simply convert that to a linear model. Okay, we're gonna look at a couple of cases. I will start with the case that we just derived um, the example for, and that is given by alpha e to the beta f of x. Now, f of x could be x squared, x cubed, sine x, whatever you want, okay? General form. This is a general nonlinear exponential model, okay? Now, as many of you ha have guessed, um, and I'll show this example next, like you see something like this when you're looking at um, uh, reaction rates in kinetics, okay? Reaction rates typically follow in exponential form. They look like AE to the minus E1 over RT, you know, gas, temperature, et cetera. We'll, we'll look at an example immediately after this. But if you were to take the logarithm of this model, then log y model is log alpha, right, plus beta f of x. Now you've separated, you've separated your basis functions just by taking the logarithm, okay? So now if you call log y model as your new capital Y, okay, so that's your new model. So your data, in this case, your data, your xi and yi, you have to do the appropriate transformation for them. This is where it gets messy. And, and just bear with me, we'll see how this is done. And you call log alpha a naught and beta, call it a one, and this whole thing, call it x, then you have a linear model, okay? A naught plus a one x, okay? Just by taking that logarithm. And you can switch back and forth between the original and the original and the new model. So your capital Y is log of the Y model and your A naught is log alpha, your A1 is beta and your capital X is your F of X. Why did I call it F of X? Because up there, like in this example, I have minus one over RT, okay? So I wanna kind of put all of those together. So here's a practical example um, for reaction rates where, you know, you're looking at some um, compound reacting at a certain rate, like how fast it's reacting when it combines with other compounds. These reaction rates are typically observed experimentally. You know, you put the things together and see how fast they react and you can uh, time them <laughs> and then measure, you know, you get an idea for the reaction rate, but there's a model for those. And that's A e to the minus E a over R t. A is just a, a scaling coefficient, they call it pre-exponential factor in this case. R is the gas constant, T is the temperature, and EA is called the activation energy, okay? So you are given data like this, for example, and we're gonna use this as, an exa as, as our example. Reaction rate versus temperature, reaction rate as a function of temperature, okay? All right, so now to regress these data, so your objective, um, sorry, I should have put red, put A and E in red. Your objective is to find A and E, okay? Because R is given to you, the temperature is kind of your independent variable, but you don't know the coefficients that fit those data. You don't know A and EA. So your objective is to regress these data given to you and fit this model with A and EA. However, this model is nonlinear, so we're gonna take the logarithm and convert it to a linear model. So you get log k equal log a minus e a over r t, and I'm gonna call this y equals c naught plus c one x. So my new y is log k. My my intercept is log a, and my slope is minus e a, right? And my x is one over r t. or another, or X is minus one over RT and C1 is EA, whichever. So with this, <clears throat> this becomes your regression model using the normal equations, okay? This becomes your regression model using the normal equations. Now we're gonna do it together when it, this, is, this will make it clear. Okay, so go ahead and grab 
your um, in notebook, reaction rate constant with gaps, okay? I know it kind of gets fuzzy, but it's not until you actually do an example um, by hand. Okay, so file, make a copy. Okay, once you load this up, let me know. I'll go through the first cells, first few cells with you. Again, feel free to use these routines here, like the R squared, use it in your homework, in your research, whatever, okay? Whenever you're using code that's available freely online for you to reuse, make sure you give credit, okay? If credit is not shown there, they don't tell you, you know, how, uh, how to credit them. Just kind of put, you know, put a little note, a little comment, say, you know, I use this from this website or whatnot. This way, you know where you got this from. You know, if there's a mistake, you can tell the developer that there's a mistake and others will know as well that, hey, if they give you their work, you're gonna cite them, you're gonna give them credit, right? So. All in all, it's a very nice thing to have. Okay. Anyone still loading the notebook? Okay. All right. So we have our boilerplate, the NumPy and you know Matplotlib, etc. And I here I just put in the R squared um, uh, function definition. Okay. And these are our data over here: the temperature given in that table in the slide. 313, 319, et cetera. So just a few data points and the observed reaction rates, okay? The observed reaction rates and the gas constant. And now I'm just asking you to plot this data, which is kind of a, like, of course, you, you guys know how to plot. <laughs> okay, so go ahead and just plot these data. So you are plotting the reaction rate as a function of temperature. So your, on your X axis, you got your temperature, on your Y axis, you got your rate constants, okay? And you can see this is an exponential model, okay? We good? Okay. Let's go next. Now we want to fit a model of the form a e to the minus e a over r t, where a and e a are our coefficients. So the first thing I want to do is um, I didn't put the text here to make it um, to linearize it. Apparently, I did have. Okay, to linearize the model equation. So I'm gonna go ahead and just linearize this. So we got log K is equal. So if you remember the slides, just grab the slides over here. So if you remember our slides, what we had, we take the logarithm, log k, and our new x was minus one over RT, and our new y was log k. So I wanna create a new set of data that are log y and minus one over RT. So I can use, it's easier to do it that way. I'm just assigning new variables. You can keep things in this form, minus one over RT and log k, but it's easier to just see it as a new y and a new x variable, okay? Either form works. I like to use the latter. Just put, put the log and the minus one over RT in new variables, x and y, okay? 
So, okay, now I realize why I didn't put this. It's kind of obvious. So my new XI is minus one over R over T. So remember we had the temperature and R defined here. And our YI was MP dot log of K, okay? Now go ahead and plot this new data. What do you expect to see before you plot? What do you expect to see? Yes, straight line, exactly. Look at that. It's like taking those data and plotting them on a log log plot, but instead we plotted the log versions of those, okay? So the transformed data is indeed linear. Okay, so if you were given these data, you'll be like, ah, of course, I'm gonna put a straight line regression, okay? So those are our new data. That's what we're gonna be working with. From here onwards, is just regression to a straight line. Agreed? Those are your new data. That's why I like to declare these new variables, x, i, and y, i, because, you know, I'm now in a, in a linear, <laughs> In a linear regime, I can just kind of use standard linear regression and I'll be fine, okay? All right, so now you do the normal equations. Your new basis functions are ones, mp dot ones of size n and um, xi, correct? Those are your new basis functions and just standard regression. And your ATA is A transpose at A, and your B is a transpose at um, YI, okay? And finally, we solve ATA, right-hand side B, and we get these coefficients. So these are the coefficients of the transformed model. We haven't gone back to the original model yet. Okay, we're in the transformed world here. So our new, if, we, if you follow the slides, I had called the intercept C0 and the slope C1, okay? So our um, C0 and C1, they are this first entry in the solution and the second entry. And here I declared the routine to create this linear fit. So we've seen this. And then I'm plotting the data and the regression line, okay? I don't like to call it best fit anymore. I'm just, we should probably, maybe this is not the best fit. Maybe we should just call it least squares fit to be more specific, okay? So um, that's kind of a little bit inaccurate on, on my end, but so least squares fit, okay? But you're not done, okay? So now, now we can do the R squared, just simply call the R squared function, give it your transformed data, okay? That transform data, we are not, because we're working with the transform data now, X, I, Y, I, we give it the linear fit. And 99.9%. <laughs> Data's probably doctored. <laughs> okay. So now, what, would, what happens to the original data? We need to show that actually, now, going back to the original data, we still have a pretty darn good model. So we're going to now go to the original data and plot k equal a e to the minus e a, a exponential to the minus e a over r t. We're going to go back to those original data. What we need are just the coefficients a and e a, right? So we have c0 and c1. Now we need a and e a. A is exponential C0 and EA is C1. Agreed? So we go back here. This is my pre exponential factor. I'm going to call it A. <laughs> okay. And now the new or the defined K new, I call it, or, you know, K model, K okay, exponent or exponential model. Exponential model, mm -hmm. talking to myself. <laughs> okay, so now we plot the original 
data, T and K, not X, I, Y, I, not the transform data. Now we're going back to the original data because now we have the pre-exponential factor and the activation energy. And we claim that if we plug those in, now our, we have some kind of fit for those original data. So I'm gonna plot the original data. And after that, I'm gonna plot a, I'm gonna plot our fit, but over a dense linear space. Remember our original data, we had only like five points. So if we plot the exponential, it's gonna look very jagged. So I'm gonna create a very dense linear space and plot, I'm gonna call it T new, goes from 312 to 333 with hundred points by default. And I'm gonna plot, I'm gonna plot the K model, the exponential model as a function of this dense linear, this dense um, lin space. So call it exponential model. Okay, look at that. Very nice, pretty. Okay, I'm gonna put the original data on top of it. So there you go. It does fit it very, very well. Okay. It does fit it very well. So now you can ask the following question. We didn't do nonlinear regression. We did linear regression. We found our coefficients for A and EA. So our model is still of the form alpha E to the beta something, okay? So now let's, if we assume or suppose or think of this dashed curve, it's a, it's a regression fit still. Although we got it from the linear model, it's still a kind of regression. So let's go ahead and re evaluate the R squared on it. R squared has nothing to do with the model if it's linear or not, right? So let's evaluate the R squared on these original data with the exponential model. And let's see what we get. So we're gonna call R squared We're gonna call it on our original data. And those were the X i's were the temperature, the Y i's were the K, and the Y model is the exponential model. <laughs> you get 99.94%. It's a different R squared than the linear one, okay? But it tells you it's pretty darn good. And the data is probably doctored. <laughs> I have one more slide before I'll, I can uh, let you go. Are you still programming on the Jupyter Notebook? Okay. Anyone? All right. Okay. Final slide. There are other examples where you can take a nonlinear model and transform it to a linear model. So the one we just saw y equal alpha, so y, y equal alpha e to the beta f of x, but there's another model where you have alpha x to the power beta, okay? Alpha x to the power beta, you do the same strategy, you take the log base 10 in this case, okay? And this is what you get, log y equal log alpha plus beta log x or something similar. Another model, and you see something like this in your assignment, um, is, this kind of alpha x over beta plus x. And you cannot untangle this as is because you cannot cancel out x and x, right? Because of the summation. However, if you invert this, you get beta over alpha x and x over alpha x, and you can cancel things out nicely. So you take the reciprocal of this one, one over y becomes beta plus x over alpha x, and you separate the sum here, you get 
beta over alpha times one over x plus um, plus x over alpha x. You get one over alpha and you call this a linear model. Okay. There are some variations on this, but that's about it for linear regression of nonlinear models. Okay. So if you have a nonlinear model, if you can transform it, make it linear, do that. Okay. It's not expensive to solve a nonlinear regression model, but just deriving the governing equations is going to take you, you know, good 15 minutes or an hour and programming that. So you might as well, if you can transform it to a linear um, space, do that. Okay. And that's it for today. I have nothing else, but, you know, my time is yours now. You got 20 minutes if you want to chat about anything, um, you know, informal. I'm going to stop the recording. Okay, and uh, we can talk about anything you want, really. Whereas if I can find my cursor. <laughs> All right. One second. <laughs>